So uh, thank you everyone for attending this talk. Uh, based on the previous talk, I see that there has to be some kind of um, online streaming. So thank you for whoever is uh, checking this out from the from from the stream. Uh, I'm very excited to be here uh, today, and uh, today we're going to talk about open source software security. Here be dragons. Who is familiar with this term? Here be dragons. Is any fa anyone familiar with this term? Here be dragons. Okay, one, two, three. So this term is usually referred on maps, uh, really, really old maps or f uh, maps of fantasy worlds for unexplored areas. Those on unexplored areas in these maps, usually there is a picture of a dragon and here be dragons, right? So it's essentially we're referring to unexplored territories. Later, I'm going to come back to this term because I'm going to refer what I'm referring, referring to with here be dragons in regards of open source security. Um, but let's let's just spend a couple of minutes talking first about uh, software. My opinion, this is my opinion. We are part. We are witnessing right now a software revolution. In the sense of companies right now, they are evolving into software companies. So I'm going to give you one one very very good example. Think about a car. A car 20 years ago was probably a driving wheel, an engine four tires, and not much more, right? What is a car right now? Think about maybe, let's pick up a vendor, Tesla. Car right now is a set of computers interacting to each other and giving um, directions to those tires, the engine to operate, right? So to some degree, these companies that they were not involved in software development, they had to migrate or they had to evolve into software companies just to be competitive, right? Keep that in mind. And of course, open source has won. And I want to be clear on this. Open source has won. Uh, there was a um, uh, couple years ago, there was a study. I don't remember who was the, the entity doing this study that said that 76% uh, of companies use open source as part of their software development. My take on this one is at 76%, okay, 24%, they still do it, but they don't, they don't admit it, right? So, uh, open source is key on the development of current, uh, software. Um, I wanted to also talk about what we're going to talk today about the agenda. So we're going to present the, the problems on open source, open source security. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about what my current company, GitHub, uh, is doing for this. And we're going to explore the here be dragons territory, which is very into analysis and open source security. We are going to present three cases. Who wants to be able, as, uh, at the end of this talk to automate finding vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel? That's something interesting, right? Right. So I see a couple of people that are interested in finding zero days in Linux kernel. So after this talk, my intention is that you are going to be able to find on scale vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. And we did it. We did it and we found uh, three remote uh, code executions uh, in the Linux kernel through Wi-Fi. So that's my intention at the end of this talk, to you to have the, the tools and the processes that we put in place for doing this. But first, let's let's say who I am, Fermin Serna. I'm a Spaniard. Uh, thank you for the presentation before. Uh, I have two titles but just one salary. Um, the, f <laughs> the first one is Chief Security Officer at SEML. The reason for that, uh, I, I joined SEML five months ago. Uh, previously to that, I was uh, Head of Product Security at Google. And uh, I'm also a distinguished engineer at GitHub. The reason for that is because GitHub recently acquired SEML. We'll talk about what SEML is, what, were the, what are the, the projects and the products that we, we, we had in place. So, um, Previously to SEML, five months ago, I was head of product security at Google. I was responsible for all the products uh, uh, and its security, proactive security, reactive security, and a lot of engineering efforts in between. Uh, all Google projects, uh, products except of Android and Chrome. The reason for that is because they have their own security teams. Um, before that, I've always been involved in exploitation, software exploitation. Uh, if I recall correctly, my first exploit was in 1997. It was an LSOF uh, vulnerability that I uh, successfully exploited. No software mitigations or nothing like that. And I've always been linked into this. I really, really enjoy um, 
being challenged by all the, these mitigations that they are in place and uh, be able to overcome them. Um, other things that happen, I, I, I was a initial visionary and developer of Emmet. The EMET is a, um, a tooling that uh, when I was working at Microsoft uh, in my first time over there, we developed this tooling for enabling mitigations uh, to make software exploitation harder. And uh, I, as a life fact, I once owned Charlie Miller's iPhone uh, at Pond to He won, but I had an exploit for this. So let's talk a little bit about the problem. The open source has won, but what about its security, right? So um, as I mentioned, there was this study a couple years ago that said 76% of uh, software uses open source. I think that study is incorrect. It, it essentially is, is telling that 24% of uh, software is still using open source, but it's not admitting that they are using this, right? So open source has won. It's here to stay. Um, proof of this is um, the biggest contributors to GitHub, and I think this is uh, something like 2017, they are Google organization and Microsoft organization, right? So if... Probably, if we were looking into this data 10 years ago, Microsoft clearly was not probably going to be there. Google, maybe they were uh, getting there, but it was essentially maintainers and not companies being there. So open source has won. It's going to stay here, but ha comes with a lot of challenges around security. Because companies, whenever they develop the, 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 their software, and by the way, their software is usually a thin layer of integration between open source components. Uh, whenever they, they develop this thin layer of integration, of implementing this functionality, they usually have engineers in their payroll for um, uh, doing se uh, secure software development. They maybe have code reviewers from other peers. They maybe implement uh, fuzzing, static code analysis, all these things, right? But whenever you import those third-party libraries, you don't know where they come from. You don't know the quality. You don't know if someone finds a vulnerability if it's going to be correctly tagged with a CVE. You don't know much about the processes that uh, the, the maintainers put in place uh, to, to meet a, 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 a decent security bar. You don't know anything about that, but you consume it. And let me tell you something. Most of the code, most of the, 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 the code that you run on production, I would say probably 80% of it on average is going to be code that you didn't even develop. Think about this. The software that you develop, develop is usually a thin layer of interconnecting other people's code and you interconnecting, inter, interconnecting it uh, for a purpose of implementing a functionality. So even from a security perspective, this is uh, you need to think into, into business continuity. You are depending on open source, right? So let's talk about CB systems. CBs work extremely well in closed source software. And uh, CB is, is essentially um, uh, an identifier that you um, tag into vulnerabilities. Not only the identifier, you also have the metadata explaining which software it is, what type of vulnerability, which versions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It works extremely well on closed source software for the reason that the customers expect the company to fill the metadata for the CV. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that well on open source software. Question uh, to the room, how many vulnerabilities FFmpeg, I think, yeah, FFmpeg had last year? FFmpeg, this video library to encode the code, so it's uh, parsing uh, a ton of formats, so it's probably going to be prone to a good amount of vulnerabilities. How many? More than 20? Yes? More than 20? More than 50? Okay, no, more than 30, yeah? Okay, let me give you an answer. Nine. How many 2018? Let me give you an answer, 20. So in between this year and last year, there were no more than 30 vulnerabilities in FFmpeg. Gut feeling, is this correct? Or maybe someone missed not to file CVs for FFmpeg. I'm going to give you the answer. Someone missed and they didn't fill uh, CVs for FFmpeg. The reason for this is that there is no customer behind demanding this. But the problem, again, is that uh, everyone depends on open source. Nobody controls it. No CVs. You don't know that the vulnerability you're subject to. Um, yeah. In the same fashion, you don't control the quality. You don't, uh, you don't control uh, if someone is trying to embed a, a backdoor in your system. So this is an example of 2003. It's a Linux kernel backdoor. 
Can anyone spot the, the, the back door here? You? Okay, so I'm going to, uh, at least one, I'm going to uh, uh, explain where the back door is. Essentially, it's here. Anyone uh, executing these two lines of code essentially is going to give the current process root privileges. There is a, this is an assignment. This is not a equals equals comparison. Okay. So again, someone was able to integrate this piece of code into the Linux kernel and think about all the places where the Linux kernel is running. Other, other problems with open source supply chain. Obviously, if uh, you are depending on uh, package managers such as NPM, PIP for Python, there's uh, tons of them. And if someone compromises that uh, package manager, we're in big trouble, right? And someone did it uh, a couple of times. Someone, the first one is NPM. Uh, there was even an NPM worm. If you uh, compromise a developer, that developer can, can compromise, can embed backdoors in their in their software, in their package, in their own packages, distribute them automatically, and everyone depending on those uh, packages uh, as part of your company. Uh, software is going to embed those backdoors, right? So, but let me, let me tell you even more. Whenever you start developing a project, you usually say, hey, maybe, let's, let's put an example, a Python project that, uh, consumes some, uh, pip. Pip is the Python uh, package manager, uh, crypto package. So maybe you're saying, yeah, I'm going to use the PyCrypto or whatever the name it is. <clears throat> that PyCrypto package is going to also import other things that you don't even know, but they are going to be there. And those other things, they are going to import other things. So at the end of the day, just by importing PyCrypto, you probably end up importing 100 packages. Do you know if any of those contain a CVE? Maybe yes. So maybe there's, uh, at the end of the, of the graph, uh, you're importing, I don't know, uh, an HTML parser, who knows for what, that contains a CVE, a vulnerability. You by in, uh, importing a Py crypto, you're subject to that fun that vulnerability and that functionality. So those are those are big problems, right? So open source software, it is free, but it is not really free. It comes with security challenges, right? It comes with uh, you need to invest a little bit into mitigate these risks. Okay. So let's talk about what GitHub is doing. So GitHub. Uh, my current company, just because of the acquisition, Sam uh, was acquired by GitHub. Uh, they essentially see the see the software development uh, in in terms of actors. And there's in this in this uh, slide, there's three actors, but there are actually four. So the first one is the security researchers. These are the people that they identify the vulnerabilities and they disclose the vulnerabilities to uh, maintainers and developers. When um, when we talk in terms of maintainers, these are, uh, we refer them to open source uh, maintainers, package maintainers, right? So you, in this case, it would be PyCrypto, Pi right? They are the ones, uh, that, um, they are the internet heroes, right? They, sometimes they, they, uh, develop some kind of software and people start depending on them. And by, by, by essentially success, they are <clears throat> internet heroes. And then we have the developers who essentially are developing this thin layer of uh, software that consumes all this open source and they implement the final functionality for the product, right? So GitHub um, is helping on different different aspects. For example, and, and by the way, there is also the fourth actor, which is a security team that orchestrates all this. So GitHub is helping in different in different uh, ways uh, to all these different actors. The first one for security researchers, um, the the one th one thing that we're going to start talking uh, now in this presentation is SMLQL. SMLQL is going to essentially um, scale uh, security research. <clears throat> Excuse me for my voice. Then we have the maintainers, and GitHub has been tremendously investing in maintainers. Uh, uh, so they can do what they are best at, which is developing software, and they, they can they can get the help as needed for other security tasks, such as uh, uh, dependency management, uh, see if they were subject of a CV, and all these things. Right? They get alerts. They get. They are essentially GitHub is making their life as easy as possible. And also, final, we have the developers, which uh, essentially is they are consuming the open source, and they are uh, they are leveraging all the 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 work that GitHub is doing for other team maintainers. So we are assuming that the maintainers are in good shape, and the developers, by consuming those packages, they are they are um, uh, getting that security indirectly. But they also they also have automatic security fixes, token scanning, and all those things, right? So this is not new. This is something that GitHub has been doing for a while. The, the, the new thing, and because the acquisition of SAML, is uh, QL. 
QL essentially is an automatic, uh, <clears throat> automate, we want to automate variant analysis. The idea here is that we treat code as data. We essentially grab your code, we compile it, we generate a snapshot. Think about as a database. And then we can write queries and query that snapshot. We can say, for example, in this case, uh, this is a query uh, looking for uh, uh, an integral overflow check that uh, is invalid. We can go later into explaining all this. <coughs> How is this useful for security researchers? So if we didn't have this type of technology where we have a snapshot, um, the, the, the code as data, and, uh, and the functionality to query that data, essentially you are with grep, grabbing millions of lines of code looking for patterns, right? But that is not enough. I mean, you, in, 20 years ago, we were grabbing for S printf, S string copy, things like that. But now we want to know if this data is coming from here to this other risky place and it's not being validated by doing this, this, and this. You cannot grab for that, right? So with SEMLQL, we, we can f provide this functionality. And by the way, SemlQL is a product that you can try right now for free. You can go to lgtm.com and use it on open source. There is even a, uh, a query browser that you can essentially grab this query, put it over there, and query any, any open source uh, package in GitHub. So again, we, we, we treat code as data, and we, are, we have the functionality to query. This scales to millions and millions of lines of code. But what is GitHub also doing? And this is uh, something that we started doing in SEML, which is essentially variant analysis. And we do the CV triage. And now it's going to be the de deep technical part of this, uh, this uh, talk. Uh, my team, the security research team, essentially goes through all the CVs that happen during that week, which essentially is 300 to 400 per, per week. And we discard, obviously, the, the ones that they are closed source because we don't have the source to apply QL for this. And we do variant analysis. Variant analysis in the sense of, okay, we understand that there is this, this vulnerability uh, that we can describe this way, that there was a, um, I don't know, a narrator reference and we didn't check the offset, things like that. If we can describe it, we can write a query. And we're going to write queries and find the rest. So maybe they found one or two. What about if we could write a query and scan millions of lines of code, or even across GitHub. So this is what we call variant analysis. Find those other things that the original security researcher didn't find. So let's just start with a simple one. This is a Linux kernel buffer overflow. So we were doing the CV weekly triage, again, 300, 400 per week. And uh, Nico Weisman, <clears throat> one of my, my peers at uh, SEML, he found a pattern of um, an array uh, assignment inside a loop, and he, during that week there were a couple of examples like that. So he said, okay, maybe maybe we could find interesting things like this in the Linux kernel. So he codified that pattern that he saw through the CB triads into a SEML QL query, and he ran it against the Linux kernel. Obviously, um, he found um, something like 1,200 uh, places, so we are scaling from millions and millions of lines of code from the Linux kernel to 1,200 cases, so this still is, is something that you need to go uh, some, uh, and spend some time on this. So what we did is we went to Twitter and we said, okay, you know what, I mean, we found all these places that uh, they were uh, very suspicious. So our friend Tavis Ormandi from Google Project Zero, he said, okay, I'm going to give it a, a try, I'm going to go through these results and see if there is something. So very quickly, he found a couple of uh, interesting places, and uh, there were real vulnerabilities over there. And Linus Torvalds, uh, a couple of days later, he fixed them. So let's let's go deep into the details. So as you can see, we were looking for this condition. Well, on a loop, a while condition, or a for loop, uh, we were looking for an array where we're assigning a value to uh, based on an offset. <clears throat> and we wrote this query. I'm not sure if the query can be seen uh, correctly, but essentially, Here's the, here's the, the interesting part is like, uh, if there is an assignment, first of all, uh, here, assignment A, if there is an assignment that is within a loop and there is a, and, and, and that assignment, the left value is an array and the indexing, uh, part of that array is, um, uh, is, uh, <clears throat> I mean, essentially it's a right, uh, right, uh, access to the array, right? And if it's inside the value, if it's inside the loop. So, Again, this is not something that you can grab. 
this is not something that you can manually go looking for uh, patterns in source code. Um, and the Linux kernels is millions and millions of lines of code. We, by running this query, essentially we went from uh, potentially weeks of uh, going through lines of code to running this. I think it was less than probably two or three minutes of uh, running this query. So what what happened is what I said is like Nico he 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 wrote this research query. Research queries are not highly precise. It's essentially it's, uh, reducing the problem of looking into millions of lines of code into uh, and it's reducing into looking into potentially tens or hundreds of uh, places, right? So he said, okay, we, we did this. We found uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, potential issues, uh, but uh, I don't have the time to go through these 1,200 uh, call sites. Can, can we crowdsource this? Can anyone help? And Tavis, he said, yeah. And by the way, I found one and Linus fixed it. So this is a perfect example of what, what I meant about, um, um, and by the way, this is the source code for, for the 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 vulnerability, uh, the vulnerability is quite funny. Is uh, whenever you plug an uh, a monitor, an external predictor, in, in this very similar way that I'm doing right now, uh, there is a protocol where uh, the monitor or the or the predictor talks to your computer, and that that uh, that uh, protocol uh, is implemented in the Linux kernel in uh, with this code, and there was a, a vulnerability because essentially uh, there was this uh, SVD uh, SVD N variable that is never checked if it's high, is bigger or not that the array length, right? So. This is a perfect example of, we went through the CB cases, the CB trias, 300, 400, again, 300 or 400 per week. Think about the amount of work that is, go, is going through, through 300 cases, understanding vulnerabilities, etc. We found a pattern and we ran it on a Linux kernel finding vulnerabilities. Um, the type of query that I was, uh, that Nico uh, wrote it's, it's what we call a research query. A research query is not a highly precise query. It's going to give you false positives, which is okay. Still, we're scaling uh, down from millions of lines of code to uh, tens or hundreds of places. There are other type of queries that they are the highly precise queries, what we call the out-of-the-box queries, which, by the way, are in open source. Anyone can look at them, and you can uh, and we, you can run them on open source in lgtm.com. Uh, you can find them in github.com, semlql. You can find, I think there's 2,000 queries that they are, those are highly precise and what we call out-of-the-box queries. But here we're talking about research queries. They, there could be false positives, and th that is suspected. We're essentially reducing the problem. So the, the, the next uh, case uh, that we're going to talk is about U-Boot. And this is, uh, um, this is more like a journey uh, um, uh, about how we, we, we did the research and how we use QL to find vulnerabilities in, in U-Boot. Uh, the previous one was uh, vulnerabilities were found by Nico Weisman, uh, my peer. These ones were found by me. So let's let's talk about U-Boot. U-Boot is an open source bootloader. bootloader. There was a talk uh, before in Ballroom A where they were talking about um, um, some operating system and they were using U-Boot. Uh, so essentially, um, it's open source bootloader uh, used in a lot of places. Um, if if you go to the Wikipedia page, it's been used on the Kindle Fire at least uh, in the past. I'm not sure now. Chrome OS devices, ARM devices, and mainly IoT uh, devices. So if you have at your house a Nest device or, uh, well, not a Nest device, if you have at your house a thermostat or some IoT devices, most likely it's using U-Boot. Couple of things that I wanted to mention, supports verifiable boot. So verifiable boot it prevents someone to boot some a kernel that is uh, untrusted. So any vulnerability before the verification happens essentially means that uh, there's a jailbreak. So um, by definition, uh, the partitions of the device, uh, SD cards or things like that, they should be treated as untrusted. So parsing the, the Linux kernel from ex uh, partitions and all those things, uh, essentially is, is parsing uh, data. There could be vulnerabilities over there. So if you find a vulnerability over there, it's uh, totally fair and it could be a jailbreak. And also uh, networking. And the vulnerabilities that we're going to disclose today uh, well, not, they were disclosed, but the vulnerabilities that we're going to talk to about today, they are in the NFS, uh, NFS, uh, TCP IP stack. So, uh, 
first, what, what we need is seed vulnerabilities, right? So um, when I started looking into this code, um, the first thing that I did is, okay, let's, let's try to understand uh, how NFS is being used and let's try to get a sense if this code is... Uh, has a, a a good sense of security, right? If it's if it was developed with security in mind or not. Um, clearly, I mean, it took us probably less than five minutes to realize it's not the case. Uh, there are uh, clear examples of uh, insecure uh, code practices, right? In this case, um, we found two mem copies uh, that they were uh, being used with. Uh, Mm, there's a third parameter that is the size of the main copy and uh, it was coming from the NFS packet, right? So the uh, NFS data essentially is coming from the network. It's totally untrusted and they were grabbing some data over there and they were feeding it to us the third, pack, uh, third parameter of main copy as the size, right? Uh, there were no size uh, checks and um, essentially the vulnerabilities are here. So uh, rlen is the variable, uh, essentially is, um, is the, the result of a function or a macro, depending on the, on the operating system and the, and the libc and all those things, uh, called n2hl, which essentially converts a, a converts a, a number from network to host, right? There is a, then rlen is being used in two places for mem copy. So here we can see the vulnerability counter in the top right goes plus two. So then we have the two seed vulnerabilities, and we are going to apply QL to find more, right? Uh, as I mentioned, I don't want to spend more time going through the code, looking for similar issues. If I had a tool to do this, to automate this, it would be amazing, and we had it. So what we did is uh, we started looking around, and this is kind of the journey, the research journey that we put in place, right? So the first thing that we want to do is we want to find all the colors for uh, mem copy. This is the second query. And essentially, it's uh, no. So this is the first query, um, and in Uboot, apparently there's uh, 191 instances of mem copy, 191 places where mem copy is being called. Right? We don't know if the third parameter, the size, is coming from the network. We don't know if it's coming from a I don't know a disk partition. We don't know if it's coming from a trusted place. We don't know. Right? So we just know that there's 191 places where this is happening. Okay. Then uh, the, the second query is essentially we want to, to understand the places where data coming from the NFS packet, the network, untrusted data again, is being used, right? So in this second query, we are uh, checking if mm, there is a field access. So think about a variable dot, in this case, reply dot X. We are checking for accesses to fields with the name reply. The reason for that is because if we go back, if we go back to the previous, uh, the previous, um, slide, you will see on the first, uh, the first, uh, highlighted part that the packet is RPC packet dot u dot reply dot data, right? So we're using the reply name as an indicator that this is coming from the data, from the, from the NFS data. The, which then is untrusted data coming from the network, right? So we found 596 places where data from the NFS packet is, it was being used, right? So still, we went from probably thousands of lines of code of Uboot to 596 places where data from the NFS packet is being used and 191 places for uh, that mem copy is being used, right? Still, it is great. We reduce the the the, the 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 scope of things that we need to look into, but this is st still something that I don't want to spend a couple of days, right? I mean, have better things to do. So we can further refine this query, but given uh, the, the the problem that we're going to solve right now is like given a problem a specific set of sources and sinks. Sources is the NFS data coming from the network, and the sinks is mem copy. Is there a data flow that links to these two things, right? That's the, that's the, that's the problem that we're trying to, uh, figure out if there is, uh, instances of, of this, uh, data link, right? So we wrote this query. Again, this is a QL query that, uh, is a data flow QL query. And if you see here, essentially we have the, the source. We, we override the is source, um, uh, function saying, okay, we want, we want the sources to be uh, field accesses 
to reply. So essentially, the source has to be something coming from the NFS. And the sync is uh, the second argument, uh, third argument, but because it starts with zero, uh, of a main copy, right? And we want to find all the places that has this flow, right? Ends up in mem copy as the third argument, and is uh, is coming from the network from the NFS packet. So, first of all, we need to validate that we 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 find the previous two uh, vulnerabilities. If it doesn't find the previous two vulnerabilities, something is wrong with the query because we're doing variant analysis on seed vulnerabilities. So, indeed, this query, if you copy paste it into lgtm.com and you query you boot, you will find maybe not now because maybe it's patched. Uh, but you, you know, at that moment, you will find the two original vulnerabilities plus four more instances, right? So we went from 191 and 500 something to check these other four places. So let's go through those four places. Um, again, I mean, I think you, you guys are getting, uh, you folks are getting the, the idea of, I don't want to spend my time. I would rather spend my time with my daughters. I don't want to go through 500 places and 191 and try to link them. We are trying to refine the query, uh, to go and get, uh, sm a smaller set of results that they can go, uh, by hand and check them, uh, all of them. So we, 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 we started looking into these four places. The first one, is um, this case where here there is an if check, right? So we are trying, we grab the length uh, with this function uh, uh, in two HL. We grab the, something from the NFS packet, uh, RPC packet dot u dot reply dot data. As we mentioned, this is the, the data that is coming from the NFS socket. And uh, unfortunately, there is a check here. If uh, this length is uh, bigger than uh, a macro. We, we, we constrain that length to be that macro, right? Uh, and then we copy into, uh, some variable. And this variable, by the way, has a size, is a buffer with the size NFS3 underscore FH size. Um, we copy, uh, something into there, right? So we found this instance was essentially data coming from the, from the, from the NFS packet going to mem copy with this if check, right? So, but the problem is that they don't, the file FH, FH3 is a signed integer. It's not unsigned. So it could co contain a negative number. And then that negative number would bypass the check and would, uh, essentially would have a uncontrolled mem copy with a huge, huge size. Uh, still it's a valid vulnerability. Uh, so we increment the vulnerability counter with one. Let's go through others, other, uh, other, uh, places where this query, uh, gave us results. So here's the same story. We have rlen. We have rlen, uh, that is, con is uh, essentially is the result of N2HL, um, uh, that is given as a first parameter data coming from the network. Uh, twice in two places and it's being fed to a function called store block. Uh, I didn't put the source code of a store block, but the store block uh, is using this length and it's mem copying twice, right? So again, the vulnerability counter goes, uh, two more. And, uh, the other two, the other two, uh, instances of the, of the, the query, they were false positives because they were checks in before. And I want you to understand that this query was a research query. It's not an out of the box. Highly precise query. This is a research query where false positives are okay. Uh, I, I was okay going through two cases where they didn't lead to vulnerabilities, but I was not okay to read all the U-boot source code, thousands and thousands of lines of code, or going through that, those 191 mem copy and that, those 500, uh, uh, NFS data accesses, right? So this was a research query that gave us two additional, uh, call sites with, uh, if I recall correctly, three additional vulnerabilities. So we had the two original seed vulnerabilities plus three more and two false positives, uh, in the query. But then, uh, we, we started thinking, why don't we m think bigger, right? We are uh, constraining our, ourselves too much onto NFS. And uh, there is, uh, there is something common in all these vulnerabilities. It's like, it is not, only using data from the NFS packet, but it is always using N2HL. 
N2HL is essentially this, this function that converts uh, numbers from the network to the host. Uh, the host could be big endian or little endian. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, the function is going to uh, take that into consideration and it's going to convert them accordingly. So what we did is what, that essentially we changed the, the sources. We didn't change the, the sync. The sync is still, uh, uh, well, it's not here, but the sync is still mem copy, the second parameter. Uh, but the sources is we said, okay, instead of uh, being constrained to the NFS data, we want anything that comes from N2HL. N2HL essentially is going to tell us that there's something coming from the network, regardless if it's NFS or not. So we ran this query, and we found eight new instances. It still finds all the previous ones, which is a good validation that this is, is still a good query, right? So let's go through the, uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities that we found, right? So again, we're trying to think bigger. Don't focus too much on NFS. Maybe there's going to be other protocols, um, TFTP, things like that, DHCP, something like that, or maybe even the TCP IP stack. So that's what we found. We found in the TCP IP stack, a couple of vulnerabilities. In this case, there were, uh, integral underflows here and here. Uh, there was never a check in, uh, into this, uh, uh, field, IP UDP LAN. There was no check that it was at least bigger than the header size, the UDP header size. So there, there was a potential integral overflow, underflow. Um, this, uh, this function NC input packet on that, um, on that specific argument, that parameter, then later is being used with a mem copy. That's why our query flagged this issue because it was an N2HL as a source, mem copy inside a sync inside this function, right? So two integral underflows leading to uh, massive uh, mem copy memory corruption. So two more vulnerabilities. Right now we have seven. So then uh, we we went through all the other uh, vulnerability, all the other um, call sites or uh, instances that the query gave us to look into. The, the, those ones were. I don't want to call them false positives because uh, they are not false positives. They were essentially checks that we could further refine the query to say, hey, in between this data flow from source to sync, is there any, any if check that does this, this, and this? We didn't do it because uh, the, the number of uh, instances, it was not that high. So then we started looking around for other type of vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, this one uh, was quite easy, right? Uh, all the, the helper functions for NFS, they contain uh, the first five lines of code and memory corruption. They were essentially copying into a static local buffer, stack buffer, um, the network packet, and the, the, the LAN. The LAN essentially is uh, the, the size of the network packet. So if the network packet was bigger than the stack variable, there was a plain stack-based buffer overflow. And this happened four times. Sorry, five times. So now we went from seven vulnerabilities to 12. And uh, a very, very similar one. But in this case, if you take a look here, they, they are trying to prevent um, uh, the memory corruption. This is the only instance that they try to prevent the memory corruption. They say, okay, we'll copy the packet, but we'll, we'll not trust the LAN. We're going to copy the, the size of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of this stack variable. The problem here is that uh, you could end up copying more data than the ones that they are coming from the from the network. So you could be copying uninitialized data or out of bounds data. Read. So another vulnerability. This uh, makes thirteen vulnerabilities. All these vulnerabilities were reported. I think it was May, and they were fixed in August. Um, multiple. There are multiple forks of U-boot. I assume that uh, at some moment all of them they are going to be patched, and this this software is heavily used in uh, IoT devices. So there's going to be a little bit of a nightmare to not only patch those forks from different companies, but to get these patches to these IoT devices. The, that's the bad news. The good news is that NFS is not usually very much used in IoT in your house, right? It could be used while you're developing, while you're a developer, and you are in your company developing the latest framework for this IoT. Those are the instances, those are the scenarios that uh, this uh, could be uh, exploited. And to be honest, uh, when we were giving a very, very similar talk in Black Hat Las Vegas uh, this year, there were a couple of people that they told me, hey, uh, thank you for doing this because we exactly use this scenario with NFS while we develop and we could be, uh, our developers, uh, they could be uh, trying to exploit each other, right? So um, not 
a real case scenario for someone in their house, but a real case scenario on someone on, on, a, on a company developing IoT devices and such. So we found 13 vulnerabilities. Uh, these are the CVs. Um, we have this internal joke at SEML that uh, U-Boot is the Costco of CVs. I'm not sure if uh, people here are familiar with Costco. Are anyone familiar with Costco? You know what Costco is? You know what Costco is, right? So Costco is this place where you go uh, to to buy some, uh, you know, uh, some food or some toilet paper, and you end up with a two-year supply of something else, right? So we went to find a couple of vulnerabilities. We found 13, right? So, uh, and I'm pretty sure that you would probably, uh, we could find more in other, other scenarios such as uh, parsing uh, file systems and things like that. So... The, the last demo, the last, uh, part is, uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi drivers and trusting lengths. So, but before that, uh, well, actually, this is the timeline. Uh, the credit here goes again to Nico Weisman, uh, similar to the, the first Linux kernel vulnerability. Uh, what happened is that there was a security researcher that on August 28th, he found, he or she, I don't know, uh, the gender. So he or she found, uh, a, a remote code exploitable vulnerability in the Linux kernel in a driver where they were trusting a length and they were copying based on that length, right? So as I mentioned, the SEML security research team, now the GitHub security research team goes through all the CVs. We identified this one and we thought, okay, maybe we can write a query and, uh, run it through the Linux kernel and check if there's uh, any other vulnerabilities, right? And that's what Nico did. And Nico uh, found a couple vulnerabilities. They were fixed and, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, twice by the Linux kernel. So let's go a little bit into a crash course on uh, Wi-Fi framing. Framing. So whenever there is a, um, whenever you are connecting, I don't know, your phone with an access point or whatever, um, there is a you send TCP/IP packets that essentially encapsulate uh, uh, TCP, UDP, ICMP, or whatever that encapsulates data, right? But there is an encapsulation on top of that to send those packets between the, the Wi-Fi devices, right? So this is. Um, this is a, a, a crash course on this. Uh, the, the part that I want to uh, mention a little bit is there is this field called IE, and this field is essentially there is uh, something called EID, which is one byte. There is an, another byte that is uh, the length, and then there is a uh, data. That data is this supposed to have the length described here, right? So maybe you are anticipating what we're trying to do. The vulnerability is that we was trusting this length, and maybe this length could go up to 255, 255 bytes, and later things could go wrong, right? So crash course, uh, remember this length. We're going to say it in the next slides. And again, this is coming from the network. This is coming from how Wi-Fi devices uh, talk to each other, right? So this is the vulnerability that was found by... Uh, Huang Wen. So he or she, essentially, they, um, they, if we go back to the previous slide, this, this structure, we're going to call EID. Uh, they grab this structure from, with this function, CFG 802.11 uh, underscore find underscore IE, and they, they put it in this, uh, in this variable. And this variable has the length, has uh, essentially everything, right? And they were essentially mem copying into uh, a buffer uh, from uh, the from the f- from from here, and they were using in the size rate len. So they were using this, and this could go up to two hundred fifty-five bytes, right? So what could happen if this buffer is less than two hundred fifty-five bytes? There is going to be a memory corruption. Okay. So that was the original vulnerability. It was remotely exploitable, memory corruption. I'm not sure if it was, uh, I'm pretty sure that this was a uh, heap based, in, in this case, pool based, uh, because it's a Linux kernel, memory corruption, remotely exploitable just by sending one Wi-Fi frame, right? So we went back to, hey, maybe, I mean, this is easily codifiable. This is essentially a uh, data flow pro- problem. If uh, something coming from here, if it ends up in memcopy, right? So that's what we did. We, we, we started with this function, the CFG 802.11 find IE, and anything that goes from there is going to be untrusted, and we wanted to understand if it's going to end up in the data flow as a length, as a size for a mem copy, right? So we, 
we and this is the the, the the query. The query essentially is anything that comes from from this function and end up in, ending up in memcopy, right? So we we run this query. We found the original vulnerability. Again, this is a great way to validate if your query is working or not. And we found thirteen uh, issues, potential issues. Again, I'm going to repeat, this is a research query. This is not a highly precise query, but we're going from millions of lines of code in the Linux kernel to 13 places. So we went through all these 13 places, and we didn't find any vulnerabilities because there were validations of this length. Okay, But uh, this was in one driver. What about the other drivers? The other drivers that could be using other helper functions. So it could be something that is not this function, something that is custom made. We want to check for that. So. I want you guys to check the query because there is going to be a very, very similar slide next and I want you to understand what is changing on the query, okay? So I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times. You see? Going back, you see? What is changing on the query? Yeah, it's changing the, the function name, right? It's exchanging the source, right? So other drivers in the Linux kernel, Wi-Fi drivers, they are using this function to get the IE. And the IE is going to be a field extractor with the, the first byte, the length, and the data variable length, right? And we are going to use the sync, the same sync. The same sync is the main copy, the, the third parameter, which is the size, right? And here we found 10 instances. Most of them, they had checks, but we found two cases two cases that they didn't have this check, right? So the first one is in the CW. 1200 driver, which essentially they were using this function. It was getting, uh, it was getting, uh, the, the length is in the first, uh, the, in the first, uh, in the second, uh, byte, uh, because this is indexed, uh, from zero. And it was being assigned to join.sSIDLEM. And later it was being used, uh, with memcopy. Again, this length could, con could be up to 255 bytes. What about if join.sSID is a buffer that cannot hold up to 255 bytes. And that was the case. It, it was a static buffer, uh, less than that, and essentially it was a memory corruption, again, remotely, through just a Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi beacon frame. Uh, so this was the first one, but we also found another driver, CFG811, which had this very, very similar thing, right? So uh, they were using this other function that we identified to grabbing that structure from the Wi-Fi uh, packet. And uh, and the length in the in the byte number two, in this case one, because it's indexed by zero, uh, starting in zero, uh, they were assigned to data uh, the reference length. And that data the reference length, it was being used in memcopy. What about, again, if SSID... It's a buffer. I don't care if it's stack buffer or static buffer or heap allocated buffer. If it cannot hold up to 255 bytes, there is going to be a memory corruption. So that was the second, the second, um, instance of uh, this vulnerability. We started with the original vulnerability that was using a helper function to, um, grab that data from the Wi-Fi. We did a query. We didn't find anything else. Still very useful uh, to have a query that very, that tells you that there is nothing else, right? I mean, that's the information. Before we, we wrote the query, we didn't know there was something else or not. So based on the original query, there was nothing else. Then we wrote another query based on a little bit of code review that we did on other drivers that they were using this other function, and we found two new vulnerabilities. Remote code vulnerabilities just by sending one uh, beacon, right? So I guess that now you see the power of you do a little bit of variant analysis, you find a vulnerability, you understand it, you codify it, and we go from millions and millions of lines of code, I'm not sure if it's millions or hundreds of thousands, the Linux kernel, to run in a query easily, couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes because of the size of the Linux kernel, and going from that size, uh, that type of, uh, that type of code and its size to just review these other 10 places. Some of all those 10 places is going to be uh, false positives or, or there's going to be checks, but you end up finding uh, vulnerabilities. And in this case, a remote code execution in the Linux kernel, even before any anything. This is, uh, it comes from the network and this is the first piece of software that uh, touches this data. So it, this is even before any TCP IP stack, right? So I hope you see the value of QL that scales 
security research, right? Instead of grepping and spending hours and weeks, you use this, you codify it, you run the query, you go through them, and you find vulnerabilities. So uh, as a recap, we we talk about open source. We talk about open. There's a software revolution that companies are essentially evolving into software companies. We talk about the reliance on open source software. We talk about open source software. Although it is free, it is not really free from a security perspective. It comes with a lot of problems. We talk about those problems: CV, supply chain, code quality, and uh, we we also talk about what GitHub is doing, trying to help all those actors. Uh, we talk about QL. QL is a SAML technology, which, by the way, is free for open source. You can go to lgtm.com and right now run these queries against the Linux kernel. Um, and we talk about three cases. The first one it was the plugin and trusted monitors. In my case, I'm a little bit foolish today to trust you guys. Um, there could be vulnerabilities over there. And uh, with the help of our friend Tavis Armandi and Linux Torvalds, uh, there is one less vulnerability in the Linux kernel. We talk about U-Boot. A uh, journey, a research journey, how to go from small queries, get the mem copy call sites, get the NFAs, link, link everything together, and uh, do the trias, find 13 vulnerabilities, the cost of vulnerabilities. Uh, and then we did the Linux kernel Wi-Fi drivers, where uh, someone, he or she found an original vulnerability. We understood it. We, we codified into a QL query. Uh, we didn't find anything initially, but we refined the query with other, uh, h helper functions and we found two extra remote code execution vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. Right? So I hope this demonstrates the powerful, uh, how powerful a QL is. And, um, yeah, I think we have a good amount of questions, so we're going to go for them. Thank you. Are there any questions in the audience? Then we go straight to the Slido questions. Uh, the first question. Do you think the results from SAML QR, QL are different than Ziscaller? If yes, where the difference would be? If no, how would SAML QL be reaching same logical condition differently than Ziscaller? So, um I, I understand where they are going with this question, but they are two uh, fundamental different technologies. So the goal for the, those two functions is the same, finding vulnerabilities. But Syscaller is more like a, a, a fuzzer, uh, essentially brute forcing and sending um, uh, bogus data to interfaces that they know about uh, to see if it crashes or not. QL is uh, more like a very analysis automation tool that based on an initial vulnerability, we codified and we found other things, right? So we're trying to do the same thing, find more vulnerabilities, but by implementing diff uh, through different techniques. The uh, syscaller is more like brute forcing, fuzzing. SMLQL is more like codifying a seed vulnerability and trying to find similar issues. Okay, that was a top question. So the gentleman or lady can uh, collect the prize. After this, that was probably my wife. The second question: yes. Do you? Sorry. Oh, I thought somebody said something. Um, with the amazing movement of open source, what do you see as the next step or leap over the next three to five years? So, open source has won. Open source is here to stay, and um, we need to help. Maintainers, we need to help developers. They need to be focusing on what they are best at. They need to be developing. They should inherit security. And I'm going to be very, very clear about this. And this is uh, more or less my new job at GitHub. We need to democratize security. We need to make security easy for everyone, including developers. They don't need to know about security. They should inherit. They should leverage security. They should just say, I really want fuzzing. I don't care about how it happens. I, I enable fuzzing and I get results and I fix them. They don't need to know the inner details of code coverage, breaking plateaus. I mean, fuzzing is one example, but it applies to everything. So what what's going to be next is in terms of security, we need to raise the bar clearly because of the dependence on, on open source. And we need to make it easy for non-security folks to adopt to inherit, to leverage security in an easy way. Uh, in short, democratizing security. Clear, very clear. 
the next question. Do you think copy pasta code, especially in open source projects, are becoming very common? We've been facing a lot of generic risks when developers go on stack change, etc., and get code and use it. Um, yeah, in fact, um, if you go to a couple of packages, and I'm going to pick one, LibreOffice. LibreOffice, they, they, they bundle, uh, they, they grab uh, libraries like libpng uh, and, and probably hundred others, and they, they they bundle them inside their source repositories. Um, then, regardless of what happened in the upstream repository for libpng new vulnerabilities, unless Lib LibreOffice uh, keeps the pace of patching things, they are still going to be vulnerable. So that's more on grabbing a package and, and bundling into your into your software. If we are talking about Copying software, copying functions, copying uh, big chunks of source code, not just a, a, a full package. Uh, I think SemLQL has a tremendous opportunity to, once you know about vulnerability, actually, let me go, let me think bigger. Each major CVE should have a QL query attached that later you can go to lgtm.com or the, the, where you can run it across GitHub. And regardless if it's copy it or not, you're going to find all the instances where this vulnerability exists, right? So code cloning, copying is a problem, but SemLQL can help you to find problems even on those scenarios. Uh, what about design logic vulnerabilities in open source software? So uh, great question. And the, 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 the answer for this is that SemLQL is not only, I mean, we, we had cases here that we were finding memory corruption vulnerabilities. But SemLQL is, is also very useful to find logical issues. And, uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Apache Strats, uh, the way that uh, famously Equifax uh, got hacked, uh, we did very interesting analysis on the Apache Strats, and Apache Strats is Java. Right, so there is no memory corruptions. We did a, a very interesting analysis on, on, on Apache Strats, and we found five more extra vulnerabilities two years ago. Those are logical issues. Those are essentially data coming from the HTTP request and being deserialized or being used as OGNL. Those are logical issues, and we found those. So SemLQL not only finds memory corruptions. In this case, we only put uh, examples of memory corruptions, but it also finds design vulnerabilities. There is. I'm going to give you another example. Zip slip. Zip slip is this uh, t vulnerability type that essentially you are trusting uh, data paths from uh, zip files, untrusted zip files, and you're using later them for opening, reading, writing. And this uh, untrusted data paths could contain directory travel salts, dot, dot, whack, dot, dot, whatever. Right? So QL, we have queries for zip slip. So SEML QL can find those logical vulnerabilities too. What language are supported? Is it possible to add any languages? So uh, this is an amazing question. So right now it supports C, C++, uh, C Sharp, Java, Python, Go was just released. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is to provide anyone with the um, capability to add new languages. We want to uh, open source kind of an API uh, that uh, if you, uh, an API so you can create your own snapshots based on, based on that uh, new language, and, uh, and then you can apply the queries to that new snapshot. So I'm going to give you a, a, a couple of examples that uh, people have been asking us. Uh, the first one is other languages such as PHP or Ruby. We want you to have the opportunity to implement it yourself. Uh, if you don't do it, and if there is a lot of requests, maybe we will do it ourselves. But we want to, this to be a community-driven thing, right? And the other, the other uh, example that people were asking us is about binaries. It's like, well, we don't have the source code, but binary, we want to query a binary, right? So maybe you can decompile it and through this binary import that data. And we can build the call graph and things like that, and then you can query a binary. It is not there, but this is the, 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 where we're going, where we're going. We want to have some kind of an API where you can do it yourself and you don't rely on us, to be honest. Sounds very promising. Uh, is it pro possible to run SemoQL on a local project without internet connection? So on open source right now, you have to go to lgtm.com. And the reason for this is because oh, we need to set up a little bit of uh, grabbing the snapshots and running the queries and all these things. And this is not as easy as it sounds. Um, I would say that um, uh, it is possible if you have the tooling. Uh, for doing this, but on open source, the easiest path is to add your project. If it's in GitHub, um, it's just a question of adding an app and you will get 
Um, you can run queries against your project, your custom queries, or you can run the out of the box queries that they are already open source against your project. Not only once, but on each pull request. As you continue to develop, uh, you will get a uh, notification about, hey, based on this new code, you introduce this type of vulnerability or not. Uh, you talked about patterns. Is it possible to use machine learning and or artificial intelligence to detect potential issues? Is it possible? Yes. And we're hiring. So uh, if <laughs> that person is looking for a job, great. No, actually, we use machine learning um, for... Uh, there, there, I mean, there is there is an interesting problem here where uh, running a query on scale on millions and millions of lines of code on the Linux kernel, it is not as easy as it sounds, right? And there is a machine, and I know for sure that there is some efforts on machine learning to, we, we run this uh, query on this uh, subset of uh, structures or data, but we don't do it on this because we know that this, uh, this query is not going to gather results in this area. So there is some research that is being done over there just to make this scalable. It's really, really impressive. Thank you very much. And please have another round of applause for our speaker.